Hi, everyone, and welcome to this 13th Geopolitical Economy Hour, the fortnightly show on the political and geopolitical economy of our times. I'm Radhika Desai. And I'm Michael Hudson. And today, as last time, we are joined by Anne Pettifor to discuss the urgent issue of our time, the third world debt crisis. And as I said last time, we couldn't find a more authoritative guest for this show. Uh, Anne hardly needs any introduction, but I do feel that I should remind everyone of what she's done, particularly in relation to the debt and also the fuller range of her contributions. Anne is a prolific writer on issues of debt, finance and development. And she has also been one of the most important activists on the issue of uh, third world debt in particular, and has had a great effect on the area. So she has, she for, in particular, she launched the Jubilee campaign at the end of the last century to uh, a, a campaign for debt forgiveness for the poorest countries. She has served as an advisor to the British Labour Party, uh, important figures such as Margaret Beckett, and more recently, uh, she was on Jeremy Corbyn's Economic Advisory Council. She is the author of many books and articles on these subjects, including debt, the most potent form of slavery. I'm sure that has a lot in common with what Michael's been writing about debt. Uh, she's been, uh, she, uh, another of her books uh, is uh, The Production of Money, How to Break the Power of Bankers. Welcome, Anne. Hi, thank you so much, Radhika. Lovely to be here again. Yeah, exactly. And so let's get on with our uh, raging conversation that we were having uh, uh, last time. So uh, what we were going to talk about is really the third world debt crisis, the new third world debt crisis. How similar and how different is it from the one that hit the third world back in the 1980s? Uh, what has been the specific contribution, if any, of the pandemic and the war? And what is the future of the third world, given that in addition to all the other calamities, it is now hit with this debt crisis. Now, we last time we started with a list of seven questions and we only got through the first two. So let me just go through the seven questions and then we will begin with the third question. So the first question was, what was the genesis of the 1980s debt crisis? Number two, what, was, what are the crisis, causes of the crisis today? Number three, are third world countries responsible for their own plight? Number four, how has debt been an instrument of world power and imperialism? Number five, is China putting third world countries in a debt trap? Number six, what is the debt crisis have to do with the dollar system? And finally, number seven, is there a way out? So last time we said many things about the specific causes that we recall the first third world debt crisis, and then we talked about the second one. And just some of the uh, uh, ideas that we had about the differences between the two is, of course, the greater extent of financialization today. Uh, and also, the uh, uh, you know, there are many similarities, of course, the uh, uh, vast uh, uh, availability of money in the first world countries, uh, the inability to invest it in first world countries, the uh, essentially, essentially touting of loans to third world countries, all these are common, but we are looking, of course, at a much greater degree of financialization. So th that's one of the main differences. But let's launch into the third question. Are third world responsible, uh, third world countries responsible for their own plight? And, and, you know, I thought we'd start with you because, you know, you started the Jubilee campaign. You had a certain very clear understanding of the causes of that crisis and why third world countries should be forgiven. So what was your understanding then and how does it relate to what's going on now? So, um, first of all, Radhika, can I just say this, that we fought a long battle and, and a losing battle during the Jubilee 2000 campaign to remove the word third world and first world and to instead talk about low income countries. And I just want to stress that. And the second thing is that, um, you know, this is during that campaign, one of the reasons that it latched on, if you like, and we were able to form a North South coalition was that we talked about co responsibility for the crisis. That, yes, there were dictators in the South who had, who were wicked and who'd borrowed hard currency from rich countries for the purposes of buying jets and, and posh houses in the south of France, um, or 
used a fair amount of that for those purposes because hard currency was so is so scarce in those countries. Uh, so yes, there is a, an element of co-responsibility because, of course, those loans were pushed by the rich countries for reasons to do with the imbalances in trade between North and South. So, you know, Britain, for example, has a massive trade deficit. So one of the ways to correct those deficits is to lend, and uh, back in the day, in the 80s, was to lend money to Nigerian dictators so that they would buy British um, armoured cars and other weaponry and create jobs, help create jobs back home and generate income from, from exports here, but at the same time to help the dictator repress his own people. So we, we argued that those there was co-responsibility. But I want to take it a step further and say that whatever country it is, whether it's a rich country or poor country, it is victim to a system. And the system is one based, of course, on the dollar, but above all, based on the deregulation of capital uh, across the world. Now, we saw that big, the first world debt crisis, the, the first global debt crisis was caused by uh, the, the, uh, the collapse of Bretton Woods in 1971, but it had actually been triggered even earlier uh, with the establishment of the euro dollar market here in the, in the UK. And that was a way of evading financial regulation by governments. And the point is that what that did was to undermine the economic autonomy of governments in the north as well as the south, right? So if money is able to flow across borders, the capital is able to flow across borders, it can do so. By doing so, it can undermine policy making at home. For example, if the central bank and the uh, government want to set interest rates quite low to suit local conditions at home, and if those who own capital feel that they're not getting enough money, earning enough rent or interest on their loan, on their money, they can take their money to another country like Brazil, where interest rates are much higher. And so that undermines the willingness of a government <coughs> to lower interest rates to stimulate investment at home. And there are other ways in which capital mobility undermines policy autonomy at home. But of course, the most disastrous is for poor countries. But there's another element to this, <clears throat> is that at least Western governments have a degree of policy autonomy. They have central banks, they have the institutions which underpin the nature of credit and the ma management and the regulation of credit. Poor countries are discouraged from investing and building those public institutions. You know, a, 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 an independent, fairly independent central bank uh, run by competent technocrats, a system of taxation, which is absolutely vital to the monetary system, a system of accounting, um, which enables countries to balance, you know, in, uh, 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 surpluses and deficits and so on, a system of um, regulation uh, and, and management of credit creation. I've worked in countries like Malawi, where those institutions do not exist. A criminal justice system for enforcing contracts. We have criminal justice systems here, and the World Bank advocates for criminal justice systems precisely to enforce contracts, precisely because they're afraid that if there's a contract to, to provide, I don't know, military gear to a poor country, that that won't be honoured, ultimately. And so the, that, the World Bank is dead keen on a criminal justice system. But a criminal justice system has to be publicly financed and publicly created. And at the same time, the international institutions prohibit, if you like, the spending on and investment in these public institutions. And the employment, you know, I, I, I've worked in Nigeria, and Nigeria could really do with, this, with a well-trained, well-resourced, well-paid, Police, uh, police, um, policing system and criminal justice system because they have an awful lot of crime, an awful lot of really clever people who can dodge the regulations. But it's very hard to build a, uh, a proper criminal justice system with very little money. And when your policemen are low paid, it's easy as pie to take a bribe from the local driver in order to avoid penalizing him for speeding or running over a poor child or some such thing. Same is happening in South Africa, the country of my birth. I see that happening where, you know, so, but here in Britain, we pay our police fairly well. They can still be pretty corrupt, 
but we give them status and money and we give them resources and we understand that in order to enforce contracts on the one hand but also to maintain economic stability we need public stability so so poor countries are deprived of the sort of autonomy that would enable them to 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 raise finance at home instead of having to go abroad and to raise finance in somebody else's currency right and and even when they do have a degree of autonomy which is what south africa has it's an incredibly rich country it has its own central bank it has a relatively sophisticated taxation institutions it has quite a lot of those and it still chooses to withhold borrowing to refrain from borrowing to finance employment the creation of employment at home and still prefers to borrow from abroad right because that imposes apparently a form of discipline on capital so even where their low income country will have these institutions they're discouraged from using them because of the export orientation of their economies so that's quite a long intro to saying why you know there is co-responsibility both rich and poor countries are penalized by an international financial system designed effectively to serve the interests of the 1% nobody else whether those 1% live in Kenya whether they live in China whether they live in Dubai or whether they live in New York they all benefit from it the rest of us suffer great thanks uh, and michael do you want to add Well, you described the kind of uh, economic and ideological interference from the IMF and the World Bank. Most other countries have uh, suffered from U.S. political uh, interference in their domestic affairs. Uh, a whole mm-hmm. century of Latin American dictators uh, yeah. have been installed, leaving uh, a residue of client oligarchies that uh, are uh, responsible for actually much of the debt. Uh, but on a broader level, uh, U.S. diplomats have. Uh, as you've just pointed out weaponized the IMF and the World Bank uh to confront debtor countries with a take it or leave it leave it offer either you play by the US rules the neoliberal rules or you're going to be treated like Venezuela and Iran uh and Russia so there's for, that's there's force behind uh, what you've described and uh they followed uh the debtor countries of uh been obliged since 1945 to follow the, these demands of the IMF uh and not just advice but demands uh mm-hmm. because uh neo neo colonialism uh really has uh, taken a financial turn not uh much more than armed force well except in chi- chile and guatemala iraq syria libya afghanistan the color revolution countries ukraine indonesia with the cia mess i guess it has been uh imposed by force uh, as a uh, finance is just the uh uh the gentle gloved hand of uh the uh of colonialism and uh i think one can talk to of uh, uh financial colonialism and if you think of uh the debtor countries of having after world war 2 thrown off the uh, uh the uh, uh colonial powers and nominally got their economic li- liberty they didn't get their financial liberty they uh were forced into a uh, a financial dependence and uh countries that did not enact these liberal neoliberal laws suffered currency raids uh and uh the IMF simply wouldn't lend to them and there could be uh basically uh uh the, the US and NATO countries would uh raid Chile's uh, currency or Argentina's and uh the IMF will only uh help countries that actually follow the US like today it's found uh the most credit worthy country in the world is now Ukraine uh judging from the uh, IMF's uh, <laughs> statement that it only lends to com- uh to countries uh that are at peace like Ukraine uh that are not in <laughs> war and that uh, have uh, every uh, ability to repay the foreign debt like Ukraine so uh you use the word and borrowed and Iraq Iraq was another one <laughs> yeah uh, but and you use the word borrowed uh most of these uh, global south debts were not borrowed they're simply in a cruel of interest uh, all through the 1970s and onward the banks uh, uh and bondholders simply added the interest on to the debt uh in the US statistics show uh, America's foreign aid uh will lend Latin American countries enough to pay the banks and the bondholders i was at meetings with the federal reserve where they made this very clear they'll always lend friendly countries meaning right wing uh dictatorships 
uh, the client oligarchies the money uh, to pay the debt. So uh, the uh, effort they actually borrowed is 50 years ago. All the rest is just added on, and uh, the money was only and uh, current and to... also exchange exchange rates, yes. exchange yes. rates and instability as well. Right. Come so, I, so yeah. to me, uh, I think these uh, debts should be treated as bad loans. You you talked about mm -hmm. uh, gee, the, the debtors can't pay. Uh, a, if a creditor makes a loan that can't be paid, it's a bad loan, and bad loans should be wiped off. Uh, but uh, uniquely for the Global South countries, uh, instead of saying uh, we're, we're at a market for finance to take responsibility, if it says it's going to make sure the loans are for credit worthy purposes, that whole principle is suspended for, uh, for uh, uh, post-colonial countries. Uh, the global South countries. So yes, of course, uh, th th you can't hold them responsible if they've been uh, their policy has been dictated by the creditor countries themselves, uh, which to me makes them bad loans as uh, as well as odious debts. Yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to add a couple of points to some of the points you raised quite rightly. So both of you uh, mentioned the analogy with uh, colonialism. And I just like to uh, 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 remind you uh, for a couple of things. Number one, you know, uh, if you think about for ex anything colonialism does is really for the purposes of extraction, right? So, for example, co uh, colonial powers built railways in colonial countries. Uh, the purpose of these railways was not to uh, integrate the economies of those countries to help make them more productive. It was to extract what the colonial countries wanted to extract out of those countries, bring it from the hinterland up to the coast and export it. So that's how you got situations in which uh, countries that... Um, were suffering famines, were still having food exported during colonial times, even in the midst of famines. So similarly, you know, Rosa Luxemburg in her book, The Accumulation of Capital on a World Scale, has a special chapter on how exactly, as Michael says, indebtedness is made into an instrument of colonialism. Uh, uh, whether it is the velvet glove or the iron fist, or it doesn't matter, but it is an instrument of colonialism. And she even points out, and, and this relates to the point you were making about uh, government laws and, and uh, infrastructure and, 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 and the institutions. She said that there is a tendency to insist on a certain type of constitutionalism so that the indebted country by its own laws becomes obliged to prioritize the repayment of debt. And this is, and this this, of course, we see today in the form of good governance and so mm -hmm. on and so forth in, in the IMF and the World Bank. So in that sense, I would say that and, and there's a third thing that is very critical and indebtedness also uh, essentially empowers those people, a sort of comprador class that has an interest in keeping the country indebted, that has an interest in actually borrowing, as you said, in international currency. Mm -hmm. um, and although in many countries, um, the borrowing has been used for developmental purposes. There are also many other countries in which they, it was not used for developmental purposes. And so, for example, today, you know, the greater freedom of capital flows allows big Indian companies to raise foreign capital for completely vanity purchases of foreign corporations and so on. This is not something that the Indian people should be responsible for, but in the end, they will be made responsible for it. So, mm -hmm. That's one set of points. That is to say that in third world countries, all the things that used to happen through formal colonial control, or nearly all of them, today happen through the mechanisms of indebtedness. And that's all the more reason why, uh, as Michael says, since these are bad debts, they should be repudiated because they are the denial. They are the, at the core of the denial of development. So the second set of points I wanted to make is also connected with what both of you were saying, that it has to do with the international financial system and the way it's created. And as we've talked, Michael, in the past, in many of our shows, um, and I think we also talked in the first uh, uh, episode of this uh, set of uh, shows on, on third world debt crisis, the international financial system is the accompaniment of the dollar system. And the fact of the matter is that if Keynes's original proposals for Bancor and an international clearing union had been accepted, or if a new such system is created as elements, elements of which are being put up as we speak by various third world countries or developing countries. I'll, I'll go into third world countries later because I've always argued that 
people object to third world because they think third world means third class, but it doesn't. Third world is the self-designation of the Bandung countries, the non-aligned movement. They said that they represented a third way, not communist and not capitalist, but a third way. And of course, this third way always leaned distinctly to the left. But anyway, we leave that aside. So I don't have a problem calling them third world countries. But anyway, the thing is that third world countries uh, or, or developing countries, they... Uh, essentially would never have these problems of uh, 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 chronic indebtedness, debt crisis, etc. if we had had that kind of system. But we didn't have that kind of system because the United States insisted on imposing the dollar on the rest of the world, leaving them with no other option. Uh, and it sort of it has succeeded. And after 1971, of course, the dollar system has required financialization. So it requires the creation of vast quantities of monies, chiefly for financial transactions. And then, as both of you have pointed out, uh, uh, and I think, Anne, you said, you know, there's so much money sloshing around in the first world, which cannot be invested in first world countries because First world countries are themselves undergoing their own growth slowdown. So then all these banks are going around touting loans to the rest of the world. The IMF and the World Bank have acted as cheerleaders to this increase of indebtedness of third world countries, saying, isn't it wonderful that now the private sector is able to lend to third world countries and so on. And so all this lending has, has taken place. And today for reasons entirely having to do with the preservation of capitalism in first world countries, interest rates are being jacked up, which is why we have the, the, the creation of this debt crisis, which is coming on top of the pandemic, on top of the uh, problems created by the uh, for the third world in terms of supply constraints and so on through the uh, conflict in Ukraine, etc. And Interest rates are being jacked up in first world countries entirely because to tackle inflation in any other way would be to question the existence of capitalism because the other and more sensible way of tackling inflation is to increase supply. And to, uh, you, you can increase supply by making public investments by, you know, if private sector will not increase supply, you can increase supply by making investments and expanding supply. And of course, uh, as many people have pointed out, another way to tackle inflation would be to stop what's called the greedflation, the ability of big, multi, uh, foreign, uh, big multinational corporations to jack up prices because they are uh, monopoly suppliers of what they are saying. So all these ways of tackling inflation would be to put capitalism in question. This is what first world countries are refusing to do. And that is why one of the key reasons why we have this third world debt crisis in addition to what, you know, the, the creation of the debt in the first place. So, but the th fact of the matter is, as in the 1970s and 80s, so today, the debt was incurred in much easier credit conditions. But now we have a debt crisis because suddenly credit conditions have tightened. So, so yeah, and, 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 and I would say that, and therefore, third world countries are essentially, I mean, in some nominal sense, they may be responsible for, for the debt crisis, but they are uh, uh, they are the victims, as you say, uh, uh, of of essentially this international financial system, whose existence is again uh, guaranteed only by the United States. And I think the rest of the world has to go back, you know, essentially create uh, a create a different financial system. So, in closing, I just like to say that uh, 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 to to say the third world countries are responsible for their own plight uh, forgets the principle of credit or responsibility, which you reminded us of. And essentially what happens is that the principle of credit or responsibility is officially denied in general. But of course, it naturally crops up. It cannot be completely erased. And it crops up in the form of debt reschedulings and moratoria and so on and so forth. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, I, can I just comment on those remarks? Yeah, of course. So I wanted to, to make several points. First of all, you know, the IMF and the World Bank um, are important and they are, there's no question, Michael, they are the levers used by the United States Treasury uh, to influence and to, um, and to impose uh, pressure on countries. But actually capital flows from the IMF and the World Bank are tiny relative to capital flows from the shadow banking system. So in a sense, from the 1970s and 80s, 
The system has evolved even more into this new form of hyper-capitalism, <clears throat> where shadow banks, which operate beyond even the regulatory frameworks of the United States, the powerful United States of America, and is what caused the 2007-8 crisis. The 2007-8 crisis began in a shadow bank as a result of the activities of a shadow bank, right? The IE, one that the, the Treasury doesn't, the, the Americans do not regulate. The flows from those to low-income countries are enormous. And as Brett Christophers has shown in his latest book about asset managers, um, the, the, the out in the shadow banking sector, uh, a small number of powerful capitalists are using our savings, our pensions, our insurance, our, our money we've set aside as a result of our economic activity, and using that to lend to low-income countries. And they're doing this, and I, for example, the, the, the worst example is <clears throat> the proposal by these rich uh, institutions to create a green boundary across uh, the north of Africa, below the Saharan desert. And, uh, but they won't do that without, one, guarantees from the United States taxpayer, the British taxpayer and the European taxpayers, that they will never make any losses on those investments in a green belt across Africa, number one. Uh, and number two, uh, that they should be free to do as they please, essentially, uh, regardless of what local governments think and so on. But it's the risk-free nature of that lending, which I find extraordinary. You know, we're now in a form of capitalism, which Rosa Luxemburg, fortunately, was one of the few to foresee. Uh, and I'm always despairing at the left for failing to understand the scale of what's happened to capitalism today. Um, but, you know, the, the lending by that, those institutions, and I just summarize them by calling them Wall Street, makes the lending by the IMF and the World Bank look puny. So that's my, my one point. But that's not to say that I don't completely agree with you. The IMF, World Bank are there as enforcers. They're there as the enforcers. <clears throat> and they are the gatekeepers to all capital, essentially. And well, many of these private uh, lenders will not make a loan unless the uh, World Bank is part of it. So it may be only 1% or 2%, but it says we set the rules for all of the 98% of the private loans. That's all, I, I, think it's worse, I think it's worse than that, uh, Michael. I think they will not make any loan, even in combination with World Bank, unless they're guaranteed against losses. This is not capitalism. For me, this is Soviet-style economics, and I hope people aren't too insulted by that. But under Soviet-style economics, you know, the, the, the capitalists of those days were protected wholly by the state, by ordinary Russians. They were not allowed to make losses. So, so we're back in that. So I call this a Soviet style capitalism, really, to mock it, really, because it's a pretense at so-called free market capitalism. So that, yeah. that, that was one point I wanted to make. And, and, you know, the thing is that, you know, I just don't know until we have a level of awareness about that we're not going to be able to tackle them because they are invisible you can't see them you know you can see you can go to washington and bang on the door of the imf and the world bank you can throw bricks at the imf and the world bank you can't throw bricks at the asset management sector and what it's doing because it's utterly invisible so that's a that poses the left with an enormous problem really and secondly i just want to say one of my great passions uh, as you know we began the Jubilee 2000 campaign, we were backed by the churches and by the NGOs, and they said, just look, cancel the debts because these countries can't pay. So we began a cancel the debt campaign, but no sooner had we got going on that, it came to, it became clear to me that we could write off the debt, and we did write off about $100 billion of debt, and then in 2005, I worked with Ngozi Okonjo-Wala, and we cleared $30 billion of debt for Nigeria. But that wasn't going to prevent the build-up of future debts, really. So we needed what we have in private capitalism, which is a form of bankruptcy for countries. Now, that is opposed by countries. They don't, the last thing they want anyone to think is that they're bankrupt, and I understand that completely. But there comes a point at which they are, they're not solvent. They're not able to mobilize the hard currency needed to repay the debt. And in those circumstances, we need an independent arbitration process between the creditor and debtor. And that, Radhika, is where we say, sorry, the creditor made the mistake here. I always think of Charles Dickens' novels, right? Charles Dickens' father went to Marshall Sea Prison 
because he failed to pay his debts. Yes. Charles Dickens, as a child, had to visit his father in this ghastly prison, which is still there, actually, in South London, just across the, the Thames, the bridge across the Thames. It was the most cruel thing. And in the 19th century, capitalists realised that it really wasn't didn't make economic sense. Because if you locked up a man behind prison bars, that meant, or a woman, that meant they weren't any longer economically active and they couldn't undertake new loans. So the best thing to do was to clear their debt under something called bankruptcy. And that was invented in the 19th, 18th and 19th century by old fashioned capitalists. You, you cleared their debts and you pulled them back into the market so that they could participate and, and again, and perhaps take out a new loan. So they saw the logic of having a framework of uh, dissolving and, and dealing with debt, which we cannot see in the world economy because creditors, the shadow banking system, the IMF, the World Bank, but also governments are, you know, are too blind with the, their own power to understand that actually they would benefit the whole of the world economy. If they had a system of arbitration where there was a decision made, sorry, you lent money to build a nuclear power station on a volcanic fault, you will lose that money. You know, it's not rocket science. Um, so that, you know, and we failed to, I think I may have said this in the first session, so forgive me if I'm repeating myself. But we failed in the campaign to call for this independent arbitration process. And we've watched the, the dramas of Argentina, because you're quite right, Radhika. You know, Argentina is where the IMF, Argentina is the IMF's oldest client. When I last looked, and that was some time ago, 2001, Argentina had been an IMF client for 50 years. So for 50 years, Argentina's economic policies were dictated by the IMF. And it only led to one succession of debt crises after another. So, I mean, Argentina is the case, is our case, is the case to be made. And and in 2000, after the 2001 crisis, there was an examination by the independent, whatever they called, at the IMF into the way in which the institution had conducted itself in Argentina in 2001. And they found the institution have failed dismally. But then, <laughs> and for a while... For a while, so interesting because in 2003, Nigeria wrote off or wrote down uh, $30 billion of debt. There was a period between 2003 and seven where all the higher income, low income countries, Brazil, Nigeria, all of those countries pulled their money out of the IMF. The IMF and the World Bank were almost going bust, right? The guys employed by the IMF and the World Bank, all of whom have got two PhDs, not one, each one of them has two PhDs, um, had no work. And then, thank God, came the, the financial crisis and Greece. And suddenly they were back in business. Yeah. So, um, so you know, there was a period in which low-income, I call them low-income third world countries, whatever you want to call them, understood they had the power to withdraw from and get out from underneath the IMF. And they did for a while. And then, and it, it, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And I mean, this is a great segue into our next question, because, you know, what you're saying, by the way, about Argentina is really important and interesting because, you know, Argentina at the end of the Second World War was one of the richer countries of the world. Yeah. Everyone yeah. expected that it would essentially become a first world country. So the role of the IMF in yeah. ensuring that it has remained one of the poorer countries of the world, or the it's not much more than a sort of middling income country, but it, it, the IMF has played a central role in it. So the, our next question is really, how has debt been an instrument of world power and imperialism? And again, you know, uh, essentially what we are saying is that the uh, you know, uh, you, you you were talking about the uh, the emergence of a bankruptcy law in Britain. You know, after putting people in debtors' prison and so on. What you're talking about is a sensible financial system. A yeah. sensible financial system is what every country needs. But a, a, and a sensible financial system would be one which is focused on giving long term patient, productive credit for uh, creating productive enterprises and not engaging in speculation and not being a loan shark, etc. But yeah. such a sensible product, uh, uh, sensible financial system is precisely what is denied to the world by 
the U.S. system, by the insistence on imposing the dollar, by the uh, choices made by the first world countries in terms of expanding the financial sector in the way that they have and so on in 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 opposition to the productive sector. So this denial lies at the core of uh, the denial of development, which is the core of imperialism today. And it is not surprising, therefore, that the elements of a response to this, which are now emerging in the form of China-centered finance, in the form of agreements between countries to pay each other in one another's currencies, in the form of initiatives like the uh, Chiang Mai Initiative or the um, New Development Bank or the Contingency Reserve, these are all small initiatives, but they embody the beginnings of an alternative set of principles which is which will be based i think and again you rightly record based on the kind of consciousness that has now emerged in the third world which came uh, in uh, in the aftermath of the series of financial crises in the third world which culminated in the east asian financial crisis of 2007 and 2008 and when the world saw the way in which the imf and the world bank acted as bailiffs for private creditors in the case even of a country as advanced as South Korea, people said, okay, if they can do this to South Korea, God knows what they'll do to us. And that's the, that was the beginning of the shrinkage of the World Bank IMF loan portfolio. So we are really at the cusp, you know, of uh, the financial structure being an instrument of world power and imperialism and the beginnings of the creation of a totally different type of financial structure. So, Michael, I see your hand, so why don't you please go first? Yeah, the big feature of the Australian debt is that uh, it, 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 the debt is not to be settled under, under uh, Argentine courts. Any dispute over debt in Argentina has to be, is subject to U.S. courts. Yes. Argentina waived its rights to be a sovereign country. So at, what you're really talking about uh, is, uh, yes, the financial system has been weaponized as a tool of U.S. political control, but it's also direct legal. The, the U.S. is the, the creditors or the judge, not the debtors. The government of Argentina has no voice at all in the terms of, of this debt, as you saw from Judge Grisa in the United States, uh, turning, uh, uh, turning over Argentina's debt that was bought for 15 cents on the dollar, saying yeah. that uh, 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 Paul uh, uh, Singer, uh, Paul gets Singer. To, uh, gets Paul to Singer. collect all of this debt in full. So you yeah. can buy Argentine debt for uh, $15 uh, million dollars and immediately uh, seize its assets abroad, its naval assets they tried to see, and for a hundred uh, uh, million dollars. And uh, that's why the IMF promised in 2001 uh, no more Argentinas. And they broke, in, and the, many of their people resigned from the IMF. They said, you know, we're supposed to judge the creditworthiness. It can't pay. And it's all overwritten by uh, the, uh, the U.S. thugs that are telling us uh, what to do and overrule what we want. Uh, and uh, the, I, they said directly, the IMF is a tool of the US uh, State Department. Uh, and uh, what you've seen is that financial control uh, has been just as powerful as military control under the old colonialism. Uh, and uh, you can think of it, as we, maybe we should use the word uh, colonialism, uh, uh, financial colonialism, because the, one of the conditions of the IMF and the World Bank is, well, you have to sell off your mineral rights sell, uh, to pay your debt. So uh, you have plenty of ability to pay your debt. Look at all the land that the government has. Sell the government uh, to the foreign countries. This goes against the 1648 principle that every uh, country should be in charge of its own internal affairs. If you could reestablish that 1648 principle at the end of uh, Europe's 30-year wars, any country is a sovereign country in charge of its own affairs, uh, then you would have the legal ground for uh, saying these debts were not uh, taken over under conditions uh, that we agreed to. Argentina not only was an occupied country by the uh, mass uh, assassinations that the United States uh, held in Argentina uh, out of Chile, but uh, the, uh, the, uh, the basically a whole political uh, uh, oligarchy there. And, uh, it's not only the debtor countries of uh, uh, what you uh, the global south today. Uh, the IMF and the World Bank 
begin this way in 1944 and 45 at Bretton Woods when the main debtor country in the world that had to be crushed was England. Uh, and uh, my super imperialism uh, goes over all of the discussions there that uh, England was told uh, you have to essentially give up your empire to the United States. And uh, if you look and uh, England up, uh, there were many debates in the uh, House of Commons and uh, the much more intelligent House of Lords uh, that uh, saw that, wait a minute, we're, uh, uh, we're, all of our assets are being stripped by the country we thought was, was our ally. Uh, but there's nothing we can do because we're broke. And so the IMF had to promise, uh, in, instead of the IMF telling England, you have, you have to devalue your currency to pay, uh, the United States, uh, uh, under the British Act, said you cannot devalue your currency. You have to leave your pound so overpriced that nobody can afford to buy from you. Uh, and uh, the sterling area countries, especially India, will have to buy uh, from the United States. So if you look at how the United States uh, did a dress rehearsal for the global south debt and breaking up the British Empire, uh, it's a wonderful uh, uh, way of, of seeing what happened. And the real problem is behind all of this uh, political control, there's a way of thinking. And uh, the real thing, what we're all really talking about is uh, the uh, kind of neoliberal thinking that the IMF and the World Bank and the universities all over the world uh, are teaching that somehow the debts must be paid without any consideration of the effect of paying the debt on overall uh, domestic growth and overall uh, economic independence. That's, re that's really the key. So uh, if you can, we have to change the way of thinking, which is what we're trying to do today, before we can actually change, uh, uh, mobilize uh, enough uh, support to change the law. So I would go further and I'd say we've got to change the system, uh, Michael. Um, and, yes. and I mean by that, not just we in the West, I also mean countries of the global south, as you say. So uh, I, I wanted to make two points. One was, you know, the system is export oriented. And I think I explained that before. Yes. I mean, very deliberately, everybody thinks the only way to survive, and it is the only way to survive. If you want to buy an Apple computer and you want dollar, dollar bills to pay for it, you've got to flog your oil at, or whatever assets you have to those rich countries. We we've got to persuade countries of the global south that, that, real, that, that there must be a reorientation back onto the domestic economy. And that applies most particularly to China. China is neglecting its home base. It's neglecting, you know, social benefits for its people. It's ne neglecting the kind of welfare state necessary to China uh, in favor of the export orientation of the economy in order to make China more powerful in the world <clears throat> and to build up the dollar reserve it needs to maintain that power. Now, I understand that, but I think there's something deeply wrong. And I think President Xi, and you will be able to tell us more, Radhika, has begun the process of looking away from the, the world and back onto the domestic economy, which after all is a huge economy. And But, you know, the Chinese people find it hard to move from the rural areas to the cities because there isn't uh, a welfare support in, in making that transfer and so on and so forth. And incomes are too low. Incomes are low in China. They're low in South Africa. They're incredibly low in South Africa. They're low in the United States. They're low in Britain. They're low in Europe. And that's very deliberate policy um, because markets can't stand to spend too much on labor costs. So, so, you know, that orientation has to shift, number one. Number two, we need new financial institutions. And I just wanted to get on to the, this talk about replacing the dollar. And I think replacing the dollar is to take us down a blind alley, essentially. It's not the dollar that's the problem. You're not going to fix the dollar by having the Chinese currency or the European currency or the Sudanese currency or whatever. And um, the way to, to fix the dollar is to change the system. And I was so excited when President Ruto of Kenya spoke to Macron's meeting recently. What was it called? It was uh, uh, on the interna inter in the new institutional architecture he called for at this conference uh, convened by Macron on the 23rd of June. And he said this, we need to hammer out in this Paris Agreement a new financial mechanism to deal with climate change that is not controlled by a shareholder or is not subjected to the interest of any one country. 
This new mechanism, he said, would be akin to a global green bank and should be funded by green taxes and levies applied globally. Um, and this could include, he argues, taxes on financial transactions, which is the Tobin tax, fossil fuels and levies on shipping and aviation, which would generate, according to the World Bank, something like $60 billion in revenues every year. Now, this is a radical proposal, and I think he's on to the right case because he's arguing for a, 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 an institution independent of China and independent of the United States, because ultimately China will also use that power of her currency to uh, enforce, her, to serve her own interests naturally. And, and this brings us back to what Radhika mentioned earlier, which was Keynes's pr proposal. We need to remember that Keynes was defeated heavily at Bretton Woods. The Bretton Woods agreement that emerged was not Keynes's. It was Harry Dexter White's agreement. Um, and he was defeated. And he knew, he understood that by making the dollar um, the key uh, currency that actually he, he'd been, that, that killed him, actually. He came home and died soon after. So... Um, but what President Ruto is talking about is something independent uh, of the interests of any country that would serve just like a commercial bank uh, and the central bank, uh, uh, just as, the, you know, the central bank operates relative to the commercial banks. They clear transactions overnight. So if you've built up, you know, if you've lent out a mortgage of £300,000 in this bank, and that bank has had £300,000 deposited in the bank. This is going to cause imbalances between banks. And the role of the central bank is to clear those imbalances overnight and to enable the banking system to thrive. Keynes went further and argued that, you, that there should be penalties for countries that build up surpluses. And there should be penalties for countries that build up deficits. The United States has the biggest trade and capital account deficit of all the countries of the world. It should be penalized for that, right? China has the biggest surplus. It should be penalized for that. And it has a surplus because it's, it's got oriented its economy and hasn't invested enough in its own people. And, in, and, and, and I know that's changing. And Radhika, please help us on that. Well, um, yeah, no, I, I'd love to love to come in exactly here. So you raised a number of really key points, and I just and, and I mean there's a substantial agreement between uh, uh, among us, but probably yeah. a couple of points of of disagreement as well. So first of all, you know, I mean, I agree with you that at the end of the day, that it's not the issue of the dollar. I mean, if the dollar was the United States currency, just as the rupee is India's currency, nobody would have a problem. The problem is that the dollar is not that. And therefore, it's imposed on the rest of the world. And this is done precisely by the very financial system to which you two object. So I think that's our agreement on that. Now, uh, I also wanted to clarify that, you know, yes, Keynes was defeated, but the defeat was a political defeat, not an intellectual defeat. And the principles of the new system that we will have to have, for example, you know, you just mentioned that the United States is the biggest deficit country, it has the biggest current account deficit, blah, blah, etc. The, the system that US, the US has created relies on the systematic generation of imbalances. Keynes' mm -hmm. system relied on precisely discouraging imbalances and encouraging a balanced system of trade, financial flows, etc., etc. And of course, the other big difference is that the US system relies completely on the most unproductive types of financial flows, whereas Keynes was determined to focus production, both at the both focus the financial system, both at the national level and such as it was at the international level in the form of the International Clearing Union, to focus on increasing productive capacity in every country. So in that sense, I think those are the principles to which we need to go back to. Now, I think this is a good segue. The points you made about China are a good segue into our que next question, which is about China. So let me just say that, you know, I think you're absolutely right that, you know, it may have been that uh, in the, between about the middle of the 1990s and the middle of the 2000s, there was a certain extent to which China, we heard a lot about China's exports. But you have to remember, China is a huge economy. And the proportional reliance on exports of the Chinese economy has always been exaggerated, even for that period. And then what you got was, you know, you saw the after the 2008 crisis in particular, you saw the ability of the Chinese uh, authorities to 
uh, turn this massive economy on a dime. So the, the immediately they realized that even their relatively limited reliance on exports was now in danger with the crisis in the United States. They immediately engaged in a massive investment boom. And that really has helped the Chinese economy. And as that boom petered out, because you can have only so much investment uh, in one big boom, they have since then followed a policy of allowing wages to rise so that, you know, you are right that a of course, Chinese wages could be higher, but they have risen quite substantially over the last decade or, or, or 12, 14 years. And so much so that there are now industries that can no longer thrive in China. They are now in the old sort of wild, the, 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 the wild geese pattern. They are moving down to other lower income countries. Vietnam, we are being told, is one of the major beneficiaries of this. And there will be other countries that will also benefit. And now, that uh, increased focus on domestic consumption, which I agree with you is important, has been formalized in the so-called dual circulation model. And the dual circulation model involves uh, uh, an, an understanding that domestic demand has to be uh, a much a bigger uh, 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 stimulus to growth in China, and but at the same time not neglecting foreign engagement, whether it is in the form of exports or or or. Um, or investment. And the reason is, I think the Chinese use foreign investment and export strategically. They want their companies to produce at world market levels of quality and so on. So they that, that's an important, that's little exposure ensures that the production remains effective. But at the end, they also take investment as a way of expanding the capacities of the Chinese economy. So this strategic External orientation is also very good. So China is actually already on that path. And I would say with President Xi's um, a declared ambition to create a moderately prosperous society, et cetera, et cetera, the focus will be on uh, Chinese in internal demand. But I totally agree with you that in the rest of the world, wages, incomes of ordinary productive workers, whether they are employees, informal sector workers, or uh, petty producers of, you know, peasants and so on. Incomes are a problem. And the overall financial system, which we have today internationally, which is supported too much by internal, uh, uh, you know, uh, by the internal laws and economic policies of too many countries, are the problem. Today, if countries want to develop, they will have to not just partner with China, they will have to learn from China that you need to have something like the sort of socialist economy China has. Otherwise, going down the capitalist road is not going to work. And just one final point before we go uh, uh, relating to, the, to our last question, you know, uh, the whole point of the IMF and the World Bank and the current financial system, the reason why it operates as a instrument of imperialism, colonialism, whatever we want to call it, is because it functions to pry open non-Western economies to service the need of first world economies and particularly first world corporations to supply them with cheap, uh, 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 to, to serve as markets and investment out, safe markets and investment outlets, which means they must always not have capital controls. Number two, so that means they are giving up their one major way of controlling, having policy autonomy. Number two, to supply China, 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 has, China has very substantial capital controls. That's right. Uh, and in fact, the, the importance of capital, capital controls controls. underlying the importance of capital con controls was underlined when uh, in the 2000, uh, in the 1997-98 financial crisis, because the countries that suffered the most were the ones that had recently lifted capital controls. Meanwhile, Taiwan, India, Vietnam, China, all the countries that had capital controls. So anyway, the point I'm, I'm just trying to make is that they pry open these economies, supply cheap labor, supply cheap uh, goods, and accept commodities and accept capital, but on terms of the first world. So essentially, it means that third world countries cannot develop. This is not the way to develop. The way to develop is precisely to control flows of capital and flows of trade and to uh, invest in your own country's capacity to produce. So with that, maybe I can just 
pose the next question, is China putting third world countries in a debt trap? Um, Ma Michael, do you want to go first? And well, yeah. I, I, the only comment that I have on that is that uh, China has not insisted that other countries impose austerity uh, and, uh, on their economies. Uh, it doesn't have conditionalities for its loan. Uh, the, 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 uh, China has been developing the infrastructure of these countries uh, in a way that helps their own countries develop and uh, their mutual trade with each other, not dependency on the United States. So uh, the whole purpose uh, and the aim of, as you just pointed out, of China's loans is different from the IMF loans. Uh, and if you look at uh, what is the purpose of these loans, uh, uh, what's the difference? Well, uh, uh, you see that uh, the, the system of Chinese lending is different from the U.S. dollarized system. And uh, the United States is trying to say, well, uh, we want uh, China as a creditor too. We want, you to, we want other countries for the debt write down to put China in the same uh, uh, page as uh, the uh, dollar bondholders. And it's a completely different system, not the same thing. Um, thanks, uh, Michael. Anne, did you want to add anything? I, I mean, I don't think that they're setting a debt trap, but I do think there are big dangers with China's lending. And that's because China is desperate to get its hands on scarce uh, commodities, essentially, but also land. And there's this huge, I mean, Africa is the site of immense competition between the countries of the Middle East and China for the huge, vast quantities of land there are in in, in Africa, and buying it up cheaply, cheating local chieftains and ordinary peasants of the value of their land, essentially, uh, because of this urge to have these resources. So you saw, for example, and I think there's a risk of corruption also associated with that. So if you look at Ghana, when there was even the rumor of oil, offshore oil supplies for Ghana, money from China rushed into Ghana, I remember visiting Accra at the beginning of that boom and house prices in Accra were as high as they are were in London. It was quite extraordinary. So my friends, Ghanaian friends, were finding it impossible to, to put a roof over their heads. Now, that's a function of the global flow of capital. I mean, globally, residential housing is now a global market. It's not a a national market or a local market. It's a global market. Any money from anywhere can land on or could be aimed at a finite resource like land or property. And that happened. But that happened most particularly to Ghana at the beginning of what was seen to be an oil rush. So I think there isn't a conditionality, but there is such a desperation for China to get her, her hands on these resources and, of course, global competition for those resources, that there is a risk of being able to buy off local elites in order to have access to those. That's my, uh, my, my only concern. But on the whole, um, I've seen that China doesn't impose the kind of imperialist conditions that we've seen from the IMF and the world, but the deeply, deeply reactionary and old fashioned and out of date economics imposed by the IMF and the World, uh, and the world Bank. So, uh, and indeed well, by countries of, of the North. Yeah, and, and I just like to say, well, thanks for that. And on, on China and whether China sets a debt trap, I mean, basically, I think one has to understand that this whole discourse of debt trap diplomacy is actually emerging as a way of muddying the waters of the discourse on, uh, on the third world debt crisis. Mm. Because the Western countries themselves essentially want to be repaid the full amount and mm. essentially want the Chinese to take whatever haircuts that they have to take. And I think in return, the Chinese are saying that, you know, folks, that's not going to work. We are willing to participate in any kind of debt restructuring you like, but everyone has to take a haircut. Yeah. Bondholders cannot be accepted. The IMF and the World Bank cannot be accepted, etc. So that's the first thing. Secondly, I think China actually invests in long-term uh, investment provides long-term patient infrastructure capital. It's actually not true that they only invest in resources. They are investing in manufacturing in third world countries as well. And I would say, by the way, and that uh, you should look at the figures more closely, but the last time I looked at the figures, the uh, countries and agencies that were buying land and resources the pension funds of first world countries and certain agencies, for example, Indian capital going out and buying land were 
proportionately much greater. And I think that this issue has to be examined more closely. I do not think that, you know, I think even if uh, uh, China wanted resources, I think China has the ability to get resources from mutually beneficial deals with third world countries that are far superior to anything the West has ever done. So I just like to to to, to point this out. And finally, uh, I just and I think we, we should probably be closing because we are nearly at one hour. And uh, so we will. And I think we've talked a lot about uh, what the relationship is between the debt crisis and the dollar system. So I think we should skip uh, quickly to the final question, which is what is the way out? And as a segue into what is the way out, I'd simply say that, you know, and you were talking about the imposition of austerity via the mechanisms of debt and so on. And the fact of the matter is that, you know, sometimes I like to put it to my student, explain it to my students like this. You know, if you owe money, there are two ways of repaying it. Number one, uh, restrict your consumption, which is essentially a punishment to yourself, or increase your capacity to earn. That is an investment in yourself. Uh, that second one would be far better for everyone. The creditors would be repaid and the debtors would not suffer. But the fact of the matter is not only does the current world financial system dominated by Western financial institutions, particularly U.S. financial institutions, not only does it lend for unproductive purposes, but it actually in the process denies by imposing austerity, by restricting and putting policy conditions and so on, it denies these countries the capacity to make money, uh, to, you know, to expand their productive capacity, thereby lightening their debt load, because that would be the result of the expansion of productive capacity. So this is the miserable, uh, punitive, uh, miserly, uh, uh, and and a financial system that we have, and that is essentially denying the possibility of development and essentially killing off people, killing off economies. So the question then is, what is the way out? And Michael, I think you wanted to go on this one first. So please yes, I wanted to sort of set the, uh, the scope of what we're talking about. Uh, the advocates of today's financial uh, colonialism say there is no alternative. And uh, their whole philosophy of development is to say that uh, we're, we're all for central planning. Uh, American uh, neoliberals are for central planning by Wall Street and by the financial sector. They want to, the financial imperialism wants to take planning out of the hands of government and put it in the hands of the financiers. Uh, and obviously, this is what the whole fight of the BRICS countries is about. And we're in a position today, much like. 1944 and 45, which is why we've all been talking about that uh, for the last hour. Uh, it, we're really creating a new system, uh, the system that was not created in 1944 and 45. This is the first time, and it's, it's taken over 75 years, uh, to actually develop uh, how should an international financial system be structured if it's going to help everybody. Uh, we're asking that question. That is not the question that uh, the World Bank and the IMF and the U.S. Diplomacy and the European Garden uh, uh, talk about. Uh, they really don't believe there's an alternative. So we're watching uh, a new alternative being created uh, right now. Uh, and the whole idea is to free uh, the global majority from uh, the debts that would hold them in a, and lock them into colonialism, just like uh, Haiti. Uh, it got its nominal uh, political independence, but owed uh, France so much debt that it never could get out of it. Or Greece uh, that owed uh, so much debt after 2015 that it couldn't get out of it. So we're really dealing uh, almost with ideological imperialism, uh, and it's the intellectual control over how to think about uh, the what would uh, ideal or, or workable alternative structure uh, uh, become. And uh, China has pointed out, well, if we're going to have this discussion, we have to realize that all these countries have different political systems. Uh, obviously, there has to be some new means of settlement. Uh, the, a new system won't work until they get rid of the existing debt overhead. You can't have a new system and still have governments having to pay the accumulation of debts, mainly compound interest, that's uh, been from the past. There really has to be a break. Uh, and uh, the break is, 
of an intellectual system and the policy is a break from having to pay these debts. That's why we're focusing on uh, on uh, who to pay the debts. And obviously, uh, the uh, it, it, as long as the foreign debts are handled along the current relations, then the countries are going to have to impose austerity, just like Germany imposed austerity in the 1920s uh, to try to pay its foreign debt. It doesn't work. Uh, if a country is told to destroy its economy and make itself less able to pay its foreign debts in the future in order to pay debts now, that should, in, there has to be, in principle, a way of wiping these out. So what we're really talking about is a kind of constitution of principle, the Bill of Rights uh, for, for debtor countries that would shape uh, uh, the new system as uh, really uh, their kind of uh, America's revolutionary war. So the problem then is to outline, you know, we're talking about a remedy. So the remedy of the current problem is you begin with a debt cancellation uh, that needs to clean the slate for any kind of a new system. Uh, you need to renationalize uh, basic utilities that have been uh, forfeited to foreigners. And you can do this under local law. Uh, what foreigners wanted, as Radic had pointed out in the very first, first statement today, they wanted the resources of the colonies. They wanted the raw materials and the mines and the land. Uh, all of this can simply be fixed with a, a rent tax. You can tax away uh, the uh, the raw materials rent and the uh, the uh, uh, land rent, and that's all under domestic uh, uh, national uh, rights. So that would not only uh, free the country from foreign debt, it would free them from the foreign ownership that has carved out uh, the control of basic infrastructure away from government control, away from uh, uh, the government's ability to provide basic services uh, on a subsidized basis, uh, uh, like the United States and, and Europe did. Uh, so you, you, the tax system has to be part of uh, the reform of the, uh, uh, the debt system. And uh, that requires a whole uh, economic analysis of uh, uh, what is uh, a country's ability to create an economic surplus. And uh, if not, uh, that really, uh, you need a, a national accounting system to reflect these ideals. So we're talking about something much more than settling the debt problem. We're talking about settling the whole financialized economic structure that debt's been put in place. Um, Anne, please go ahead. Yeah, so sure. I mean, I have to agree with Michael that actually it is uh, cheering and it is optimistic that we are talking about new systems and 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 that it hasn't that hasn't been the case for a while. It's exciting to hear of the alliances building up around China and so on to discuss, uh, you know, replacing the dollar. However, there is another way in which we can deal with this American imperialism, and that is protectionism, authoritarianism, and the rise of fascism. And 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 I'm here I am a Polanyian. Polanyi was right that the whole notion which we have today of a global market in capital, the shadow banking system, governing the world is a utopian notion right and it would lead to so much annihilation of human civilization the ecosystem that society would react and demand protection and and that gives the rise to authoritarianism and i'm afraid you know it's very exciting to see lula elected as president of brazil but he cannot get a thing through his congress he got a single item of policy through his congress because of the far right domination of the congress we look around the world and we see authoritarian dictators push, pulling up the, the protectionist walls now you know i'm not against all forms of protection but from a capitalist point of view from the point of view of this soviet style capitalism it is disastrous because that will bring down the dollar. That will defeat the system. That will, fascism will deal with this form of utopian capitalism. So, you know, I think while we must be encouraged by the discussions that are happening, we must also be very alive to the, I mean, I'm watching my own country, Britain, so-called home of liberalism and parliamentary democracy. We have we're being read now by a very far right government which is overtaking our institutions the broadcasting institutions our health service it's doing everything it possibly can 
uh, to break down, if you like, the liberal democracy on which Britain is based. And it's terrifying to watch because it is, you can see the rise of fascism in some of our political leaders. Um, so I, I don't want to, you know, I know this is not a cheerful way to end this podcast, but I just want to warn us that, and I want to warn, if you like, uh, you know, hyper-capitalism, that if you go along that road of actually treating countries in this way, you are going to get fascism, as you did in the 1930s. I, I, yeah, I think, you know, uh, Anne, you're absolutely right to remind us of Polanyi. And I think you're absolutely right that he exactly, he said that when you have this kind of hyper-liberal uh, yeah. a, a, a system. And of course, as you rightly pointed out, it's no longer even liberal. It's some kind of risk-free uh, yeah. government guaranteed capitalism. But let's leave that aside. But for what it does is it imposes these uh, 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 relations, liberal relations on the rest of us. And in that situation, you do face, the humanity faces a choice between fascism and um a socialism. And I think that the, the point is that, yes, fascism is, I completely agree with you, it's a danger. I mean, look at India, for example, right now. I mean, there we have, uh, you know, just kind of full-blown uh, a fascistic type of government, fascist type of government, whatever you want to say. Uh, so, so, and of course, we had Bolsonaro in Brazil, and you still like, as you say, the Congress is packed with uh, uh, right wing people in Brazil today, and and so on. And and I would say that the you know, fascism is rising across Europe. Uh, the West is allying with fascist forces in Ukraine. I mean, the things, the the, the the contradictions are multiplying, and that's really why we need to raise the whole issue of socialism today, because I think the only sensible way out of this is actually, you know, because once liberalism fails and it's bound to fail, it's too contradictory, then you're faced with the two forms of uh, non-liberal societies or anti-liberal societies. Yeah. One is fascism, the other is socialism. And you have to say that, you know, socialism is the way forward. You cannot have authoritarian fascism. So I thought, I mean, first of all, let me say, I think this has been a wonderful discussion. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much uh, to to everyone, to Paul, and of course to all our, to our audience. I thought I would just end by making the following remark. You know, somebody mentioned planning just now. I forget which one of the two of you it was, but you know, one way of thinking about the system today is that you know all financial systems are a form of planning. There is no doubt about it. So the real issue is: do we have planning? for broad-based prosperity and the development of productive forces of e for equal societies, for ecological societies, for, for prosperous societies. And for managing the climate crisis. And exactly, for ecological and, 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 and attacking the climate crisis and dealing with the other two ecological emergencies as well, the loss of biodiversity, pollution, all these things. So do we have that kind of planning or do we have the kind of planning we have right now which is essentially financial planning to subordinate the whole world to the big corporations of a small number of rich countries not even the rich countries as a whole just the big corporations of these rich countries this is the choice before humanity this is the choice uh, that we confront when we are trying to face uh, uh, when we are trying to answer the question what kind of financial system do we have because if there's one question that the current debt crisis uh, that is raising current debt crisis of the developing world, the third world is raising, it is this question. And so I think we thought we would leave you with that question. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thanks to Anne for joining us. Hopefully we'll have you back soon on another exciting uh, set of discussions like this. And uh, so, yes, goodbye until another fortnight. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Cheers.